Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and the one who makes us one. Amen. He was hiding back under the steps, under the stairs, when he heard the garage door opening. Trembling, he wondered how mom was going to feel about those missing cookies. As she left for a quick tra shopping trip, she had warned, you're going to be in big trouble if you touch those cookies, therefore my meeting with the ladies at church tonight. But they were so tempting. He could smell that wonderful aroma and he could almost taste those melting chocolate chips on his tongue. And his mouth watered. And he said to himself, just one. I'll just take one. And sure enough, they were just as good as he imagined they would be. And one wasn't enough. He had to have another one. He tried to rearrange them on the cooling rack so that mom wouldn't notice that a couple were missing, but he knew that ultimately she was going to figure it out. And then he heard the garage door opening. What kind of punishment would it be? Would it be that bend over and grab your ankles so that I can use the paddle kind of punishment? Or would it be that go to your room without supper tonight kind of punishment? But maybe if mom thought that he had gone down the street to pray, play with friends, she'd have time to cool off and forget all about it. What kind of thoughts go through your mind when you know you've messed up? Next one. There we go. What kind of God comes into your mind when your conscience is accusing you? When you expect that he is searching you out to find you in your hiding places? How's he going to be feeling about you? The words that we hear in Luther's explanation to the Ten Commandments might cause us a little trepidation. Remember those words? I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing love to the thousands of generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. So is the God that you are expecting to be searching you out, the God who brought poisonous snakes in to punish the Israelites out in the wilderness? Or is it the God who comes to you as the good shepherd, gently lifting his sheep on his shoulders to carry them home? How is God feeling about Adam and Eve as they hide in the garden in our lesson today. When we look at that account in Genesis, it would be easy to get lost in what Adam and Eve are doing. There is the shame that has caused them to cover up their nakedness. There is the guilt and the fear that has brought them into hiding from God. And there is that fear that this kind of punishment that God is going to hand out to them is going to be worse than that bend over and grab your ankles kind of punishment. Because hasn't God said, the day you eat the fruit of that tree, you will die. And then there's the blame game that's going on as Adam actually blames God for giving him a woman in the first place, and then turns around and blames the woman for giving him the fruit. And of course, Eve isn't going to stand for that. 
she blames the serpent for tempting her in the first place. But when we look more carefully, it isn't Adam and Eve who are the main characters in this drama that is happening before us. They don't know it, but they're already dead. As St. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, dead in trespasses and sin. They had a wonderful bond with God. He walked with them in the coolness of the garden. But that is gone. Now they are powerless to come back to him. And in fact, now they are thinking of themselves as being independent of God. They have grasped hold of that idea that they can be little gods themselves. And so in the back of their minds, there is now that kind of resentment that God would call them to account and take away that freedom that they think they have found in eating the fruit. But now they are sad, pathetic, helpless characters. And do I need to say it? We are right there along with them. And so our consciences accuse us, and we hide from God. I came across a story in my reading recently. It's fictional, but I think it helps demonstrate how that kind of hiding cripples us as we hide from God. And not only from him, but from others and from ourselves. A 26-year-old woman has been putting on a brave front before her friends for years now, but she has come in contact with another person who is struggling, and she's moved to share her own story to try to help him. She says, When I was six, 20 years ago, we were driving through a snowstorm down a winding road. My mom was begging me to settle down so she could concentrate. But I kept teasing my brother in the back seat. He screamed when I pinched his leg. His screech made mom take her eyes off the road for just an instant. And then we slammed into the tree. If I had listened, I'd have behaved and they would be alive. They'd be alive, and my dad wouldn't be broken-hearted. He wouldn't have turned into a drunk. So, you see, it's not about forgiving him. I deserve to suffer for what I did. Sadly, when we hide from God, our consciences still accuse us and leave us broken even when we try to put on our brave fronts. But thankfully, our story for today isn't primarily about the sad state in which we fall when we join Adam and Eve in sin. For this account in Genesis is really a first glimpse at the Good Shepherd, our God, who never gives up on lost sheep. This account shows us an anguishing father who sees what sin has done to tear apart the family that he created, who is now seeking to bring them back into his loving embrace and into that family he intended them to be from the very beginning. And though God obviously knows where Adam and Eve are hiding, he doesn't drag them out of their hiding place to tell them, bend down and grab your ankles. But he calls them, giving them an opportunity to fess up, to come clean, to repent. And while they are 
sidestepping their obligations to him, pointing fingers at one another, he patiently waits for them to respond to his gracious love. And he begins to address the root of the problem. He addresses that saying, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. And so begins the story of the anguished father who seeks to restore his children back to the family, back to where they belong. This father is not just the God of second chances. This father is the God of hundreds of chances. This God is the God who forgives seven times 70. And his is the story of pursuing the children of God all of the way through the Old Testament. The story of his bringing the seed of the woman, his son Jesus, into the world to crush the head of the serpent and overcome death in order that he might restore the family. And so we see Jesus in our gospel lesson today, surrounded by family, but it's a much bigger family than you might think it is because his own family doesn't even fully understand who he is and what he's about. And most certainly that family of the Jewish community into which he has been born does not appreciate that. They're already looking to take care of killing him. And though his family might be rightfully concerned about those who want to kill him, he understands that this is what he's about. He is here to crush the head of the one that's about to bruise his heel. And notice what's over on the side. It is the cross through which he comes to crush the head. There's another one that I didn't include here as an example, where below the cross is Satan with his hands in the air, almost declaring victory. But it's going to be a short-term victory, isn't it? It's going to be a three-day victory. And then the Heavenly Father gives his own son a resurrection victory. And in that victory, he overcomes death and the one who brings death into our world. And in that victory, he brings about that which we hear him speaking in our gospel lesson today where he says that through him, the sins of the children are forgiven. And don't think of just little ones when you think of that. Next one. As he comes and brings the power of his forgiveness, it enables us back into that ability to embrace one another as reunited, forgiven, and reunited. It brings back not only those personal relationships, but it also brings us back into the family that he had intended for us to have from the very beginning. And the way that we bring about that family as part of what he has done for us is as I told the children this morning. We exercise that forgiveness which he has already brought into our <laughs> lives personally. As he adopted us through the waters of baptism, washed us clean and made us his own, as he comes to us with that powerful word of forgiveness in his own body and blood, as he shares himself with us in Holy Communion, so that we might be brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers to one another with him surrounding us all. Amen. May the peace of God that passes all understanding Keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus and the unity that he gives to life everlasting. Amen.